And welcome to today's BIC Streams for A Journey in Archaeology, a conversation with Dr. Sharda Srinivasan on her work in studying the metals and materials heritage of Southern India. Art and science come together in her work in a rare interdisciplinarity in our world of specialization. Sharda will walk us through some illustrated highlights of her contributions in archaeology, archaeometallurgy, and art history. At present, she is professor at the National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bengaluru, and has written several books and 70 related papers. Some of her book titles from which I'm sure she'll be speaking today uh, include Ecstasy of Classical Art, which is on the Indian Bronzes in the National Museum Collection, Cosmology and Nataraja, and India's legendary Boots Steel. Among her many awards are the Padma Sri in Archaeology in 2019 and the Kalpana Chawla Women Scientist Award in 2011. Sharda, it's a great pleasure to have you on our program today. Thank you so much, Pratiti. And it's a wonderful opportunity to speak here for the BIC streams and a great privilege. So thank you very much. And uh, right. let's, well, let's begin with some of your early work. Um, we had a chance meeting at the Smithsonian's Freer Gallery in Washington, DC in the late 90s. Uh, you were doing a postdoc there. Uh, you just finished your PhD at the Institute of Archaeology at University College London uh, after a master's at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had worked on the technical fingerprinting and stylistic authentication of South Indian metal icons, in particular Chola and Vijayanagara bronzes. Could you tell us about uh, what that early work was about? What is lead isotope and trace element analysis for us? non-scientists, uh, they're all mysteries. So, uh, well, as I was saying, it's a really nice opportunity to share uh, my journey in archaeology, so to speak, which has been probably quite eventful and idiosyncratic in many ways. And uh, it's very nice to be able to take you through the study of the metals and materials heritage of South India, which uh, has been such a big part of my background, which has brought together these very diverse interests, as you were pointing out, as a scientist and also the artistic interests. And also, it has in part also been motivated by my interest in Bharatanatyam and classical dance. Well, for any engineering graduate, of course, the 11th century Brihadishwara temple, the colossus built by Rajaraja Choran in Tanjavur exercises a great hold on the imagination. And according to inscription, this temple had some 60 metal icons of deities, which were intended for processional worship. And only two of these are now extant in the temple, one of Nataraja, the Lord of Dance, Shiva as the dancing Lord, and Shivakami, his consort. And this image is also known as Ardavalan in Tamil inscriptions and was the Kula Devata or the family deity of the Cholas. And the Cholas, of course, were munificent patrons of art and dance and temple building, which has also left behind a great legacy to this day. Well, the Nataraja bronze is, of course, the most spectacular example of early bronze casting from southern India. And Ananda wrote of the Panchakritya or the five activities of Shiva from 13th century Shaiva Siddhanta texts, where he talks about how the drum represented Srishti or creation and the fire in the other hand represented Samhara or destruction and how this image balanced these notions of forces of creation and destruction. And the French sculptor Rodin was moved to write of Nataraja that it was une chose divine more regle, or something divinely ordered. And indeed, the Nataraja image depicts the human form within a circle in a way predating the Renaissance and Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvius man. So there is this sense of sacred geometry where the figure is set within the satkona or the six-sided star. And the compositional analysis that I had undertaken of the bronze showed that it had 8% tin and 8% lead. 
a leaded bronze. It is also amazing that this bronze and the several temples were greatly patronized by the remarkable Chola queen, Sembi and Mahadevi in the 10th century. And you're looking at a very remarkable image, which is thought to be a portrait of the queen as per some art historians, such as Vidya Dehejia. So isn't this the one which is at the Freer, the gallery that we, where we met? Yes, the resident Devi of the Freer Gallery. Uh, and quite, quite remarkable that, you know, she commissioned all these Natarajas and... Yes, indeed. And in fact, there were deified images of the Queen which were taken out in worship. And there is also a town to this day which is named after the Queen, Sembi and Mahadevi. So it was a very uh, powerful legacy of hers. Well, the practice of making metal icons is one that has continued even into this day in the Tanjavur district. And the making of images followed processes which have been practiced over generations, whereby, as you're seeing here in the workshop of Radha Krishna Sapati in Swami Malay in Tanjavur district, first the wax model of the icon to be cast is carved as it were. And then it is invested with numerous layers of clay to form the mold. And then the mold is heated so that the wax is expelled. There is a resultant hollow and then the alloys are melted and poured in so that you get the metal icon. And this process was known as Madhu Chahista Vidhana as well in medieval treatises. And it's also interesting that the term that they use in Tamil to describe the mold itself is Karu, which is also the word for the womb. So there is a sense of the birthing process. And in fact, the ninth century Tamil woman poet saint, Andal, compares the dark mold with wax to rain clouds, which she beseeches to pour down on Venkatam or Vishnu, who is her uh, beloved Lord. Um, so this method, this lost wax method, uh, the exquisite Mohenjo-daro dancing girl, the famous statue, would that have also been made with the same technology? Yes, uh, the Mohenjo-daro dancing girl, mind you, is a really tiny bronze almost in miniature, but very beautifully modeled. So it is in three dimensions and it would have been made by the lost wax process. And this technique was by then in vogue in the Near East and also the Harappan uh, regions and so on. And it's quite and interesting the way she has her hand on the waist, which if you know, it's a very much a part of the Sadir or Bharatanatyam tradition as well. So you do see these remarkable continuities there. Um, and how about the Greek bronzes <clears throat> from the classical age? Are they also uh, made with a similar method? Well, the Greek bronzes are also made from the lost wax technique, but there is a further innovation that comes in there whereby they use a clay core and then cover it with a layer of wax and then invest it with numerous layers of clay to form the mold. So finally, when the casting is done, it's really a thin layer of metal. And by that method, they could actually save on the metal used. So, well, since you asked me about the stylistic uh, and the technical analysis, Pratiti, I would uh, like to now come to the lead isotope analysis as well, which you mentioned. Well, you see, because so many bronzes were being cast over centuries, and quite often many of them didn't have inscriptions because many of them are really deities. So there are problems in telling apart bronzes of a later period from bronzes of earlier periods. So the metallurgical profile comes into use there in providing a tracer to tell apart different groups of bronzes. And lead isotope analysis, lead isotope ratio analysis can be quite sensitive because the isotopic ratios of lead can vary due to the different sources of metal that were used, which of course is dependent on the uranium thorium uh, geochemistry. So what I was able to find in a nutshell is that, for example, the 10th, 11th century Chola images had a different lead isotope ratio proportion from, for example, the Vijayanagara bronzes of the 15th century, which are attributed to the Vijayanagara rulers who ruled from Hampi, but their feudatories also ruled in the Tamil region and so on. And amongst the interesting findings, for example, if you look at that Parvati image from Kuriyakadu, it is actually a bronze which is rather well made. So for instance, the government museum Chennai also had labeled it as a 10th century bronze. 
But when you actually look at the lead isotope ratio and trace element analysis and so on, it actually fitted the Vijayanagara cluster. And actually, when you look at it closer, it is rather different from the Chola pieces, which you see on the top, for instance, the Parvati and the dated Kali from Seni and Viduthi, which has a 10th century inscription, mind you. And the accoutrements and the ornaments are rather simple and much more like what you see in this Rama image, which is now in the Victoria and Albert Museum, which was fingerprinted to the Vijayanagara era. And that image is also of brass, whereas if you noted the earlier Chola piece was leaded bronze, whereas this had about 21% of zinc. And another interesting aspect was in terms of the modeling and the iconometry, because it is also possible to see that the 13th century Rama image from Thiruvelangadu has a proportion which fits what we call the Ashtatala, which is associated with an idealized man. Whereas the Rama image from the Vijayanagara period which has been fingerprinted to that period, shows a proportion which is what we call dashatala or the 10 talas measurement, which is really associated more with major deities like Vishnu. And it also corresponds to the fact that in the Vijayanagara period, the Rama worship assumes a much more prominence and there is an entire temple, the Ramachandra temple, which is uh, you know, constructed in the Vijayanagara period who were great Vaishnava rulers. So there are all these interesting facets that, that are picked up in these um, terms of putting together scientific and artistic evidence. And there were also a lot of interesting uh, uh, findings with respect to the bronzes, which are of Buddhist affiliation from the Tamil region. And you're looking here at a very spectacular gilt Buddha image from Nagapatinam, which is a coastal town in Tamil Nadu, which was attributed from technical fingerprinting to the late Chola period, about the 12th century or so. And interestingly, that image also had lead isotope ratios, which were quite close to this very spectacular image of Tara or Patini Devi, as she's called, which is found in Sri Lanka. And it does suggest perhaps- was it, wasn't, she, wasn't she from a shipwreck? Didn't you mention that she was part of a shipwreck? Yes, and that is what done all right for that. It's it's not in bad shape. The image. Yes, and uh, well, that's because also she's gilded, and in fact, that was what the uh, late Douglas Barrett, who was at the British Museum, had commented that she had come in on a shipwreck, and she's found in northeast Sri Lanka in a way. So that's also interesting. So it is possible that there was some Tamil connection. I'm not saying that she was only one or the other, but there is certainly some syncretism going on here in terms of some Tamil connections for this Sri Lankan bronze. And the Nagapatinam gilt Buddha, if you look at it, it is also very similar stylistically to this very celebrated image of the Sultan Ganj Buddha, which is a spectacular life-size Buddha in the Birmingham Museum. It has the same kind of drapery and so on. But you see that the Nagapatinam Buddha also has a, you know, the, the base of it, the floral, the lotus base also has these holes, which means that it was taken around in procession like the other South Indian bronze icons. So it's remarkable because this is also the story of how objects and technologies circulate. You know, the Sultan Ganj Buddha, uh, you, know, you talked about the Greek bronzes and Mohenjo-daro. Um, but I can't help remarking that the uh, Parvati on the left, um, you know, she has the classic uh, bent knee and in your earlier slide also, all the women, uh, all the figures of women had the bent knee and the classic S shape, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, the Buddha is standing straight, very straight. Yes, absolutely. This is uh, what is described as the bhanga or the flexion. And sometimes it goes into the triple flexion or the tribhanga. And uh, this is found in these classic Parvati images. And also you saw it in the Rama images, if you remember. And that's also one reason for uh, pointing out that this uh, Sri Lankan Tara is rather more in a way, uh, a bit more like these Chola examples with this market flexion. But of course the erect posture that you mentioned for the Buddha images, that's also very interesting. And you do see that however, in the Vishnu images, but Buddha is, you know, stands in this very um, majestic and samapada erect position, as you were yeah. saying. And you, you do also see uh, the, the Greek uh, uh, sculptures of uh, 
female goddesses always have this kind of bent knee and S shape. Oh, well, yes, that's an interesting point. Well, talking of the Hellenistic influence, one should mention that, in fact, the Sultan Ganj Buddha is made, um, you know, I had pointed out the Hellenistic fashion of making a clay core and then a thin layer of the uh, wax so that it results in a thinner casting. And that's really what has been followed in the Sultan Ganj Buddha. And this seems to have been an influence that came in, you know, through the Hellenistic incursions into the Gandharan region and then coming into Northwestern and then Northern India in, in, right into the late Gupta period in the seventh century. And I just want to also point to uh, these uh, uh, other two photographs that you're seeing here, which show that the uh, Pallava Vishnu, the seventh century Pallava Vishnu was actually made by the solid casting process, was that where I was I telling you about how the image is made of a solid piece of wax. And next to it is an earlier image, an Andhra Pallava image of about the fifth century, which is clearly hollow cast because you can see that there is a bit of wood that's been placed to prop it up. And uh, so you see that thinner layer of metal. So this earlier image also tends to follow the earlier practices of hollow casting, which was done in Northern India. But then later on, you get this full blown solid cast image. And that is also what the, um, these Buddhist guild images, gilded images also follow the solid casting method. So your, your graduate work really brought you to the artistry of South Indian bronzes in these fabulous museum collections and uh, wonderful art historians who you worked with. Uh, of course, Vidya Deheja was at the uh, Freya and you mentioned Kumaraswamy from the past, but who were some of the influential scholars and collections that you encountered? Well, I was very lucky that uh, at that time I had the support of, of course, my supervisor at the Institute of Archaeology in London, Lady Ian Glover, who also had put me in touch with Dr. John Guy, who, of course, he's now with the Metropolitan Museum, but at that time he was with the Victoria and Albert Museum, and uh, Debbie Swallow, who encouraged me a lot in this work and you know, gave me all this access to these bronzes so, to study them. Wonderful. And I mean, handling metal sculptures that are a thousand years old, you know, with the Chola pieces and more than 500 years old with the Vijayanagara piece bronzes, uh, what does that feel like? I mean, these images were really designed to inspire awe in their form, were they not? I mean, they're so highly polished and so on. So actually holding them in your hands and working with them. Yes, it's quite awe-inspiring because they've had, you know, so many different kinds of uh, associations. And you also get to see the great skill and the technique. For instance, these gilded images, you know, that itself was not a trivial process because they would have had to have applied an amalgam of mercury and gold and then burnished it so that the mercury uh, sublimated, leaving behind this beautiful layer of gilding. So there are so many of these little nuances that you understand better when you study them. And of course, that uh, gorgeous Parvati with her attendant on the left, um, uh, you know, uh, leads to some of your work in Bharatanatyam. Uh, you studied uh, and trained in Bharatanatyam, gave an, uh, your Arangetram and practiced and performed through all your studies in later years. Um, Tell us about some of the places where your performative practice influenced your scientific work, perhaps. Uh, I know you performed at the exhibition of Chola Bronzes at the Royal Academy uh, exhibition in 2007. Um, tell us about some of that. Yes, of course. I mean, Parvati, of course, stands in the classic posture, as you mentioned, with the Kapita Mudra. But uh, there's a whole story here when it comes to this um, spectacular Nataraja image, which is very close to my heart as well, in terms of bringing together uh, the scientific uh, appreciation with the aesthetic uh, uh, appreciation as well. And one of the very interesting findings from the archaeometallurgical fingerprinting was that the Nataraja bronze, which is typically uh, the term that is used to describe the image of Shiva dancing with the leg extended in what we call the Bhujanga Thrasita Karana. And in fact, you do see a Pallava description of the Bhujanga Thrasita Karana in that seventh century pilaster. And you also see a snake under it because the Bhujanga Thrasita is really uh, one of recoiling from the snake. Well, this is a classical posture which is normally associated with the 10th century Chola bronzes. But I found that this image 
was already of the Pallava period and had this particular depiction. And indeed, when you look at it closer, this bronze also looks like a lot of other Pallava bronzes. And in the Pallava period, in the 7th, 8th century, you do see these different depictions of the dancing Shiva. You see the Natesha in the Urdhva Danu, Janu posture and so on. And as you can see, this is a very spectacular example also of the Chalukyas in Badami, which is a Natesha image dancing in Chatura Tandava. So this distinctive posture of uh, Bhujangatrasita Karana is already in vogue in the Pallava period. And that is also very interesting in terms of the devotional poetry, because you have the poetry of Manika Vachikar and so on, uh, you know, to Pillai, where he sings of Adiyo Mantamu Milladavar, Mundiyam Del, Nade Iridiyo Manai, the one who is without beginning or end, you know, the one who is the top, the bottom, and the middle. So this sense of connecting the inner space and the outer space. And I another... Say that, uh, I have to say that that Natasha uh, was, it, he looks so light. He really looks like he's dancing. He's, you know, uh, seems yes. I mean, so light on his feet. Yes, and, 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 you know, he has a very boyish expression. So you also have yeah. the sense of the Ananda Tandava, you know, yeah. because although it is a pure, so-called furious dance, destructive dance of Tandava, there is also the sense of Ananda. So you get that sense of, you know, um, certain elation in that image, which is yeah. very well captured there. Yes. Yeah. Well, and uh, so you see this connection between the inner space and the outer space that I was talking about, that really came to me with these studies that were also made on um, the iconography whereby at the Chidambaram temple, the Nataraja bronze is worshipped as the formless Akasha, as well as the anthropomorphic dancing image. And in fact, in the month of December, in what is called the month of Margari, you see the Orion constellation right overhead the temple. And there was a fascinating collaboration that I got into with the late astrophysicist Nirupama Raghavan, whereby we plotted the star positions of the Orion constellation onto the body of the Nataraja image. And in fact, the star Beetle Juice is um, described as Arudra. So Arudra actually refers to Nataraja as this particular star, Beetle Juice, which incidentally, I was just reading yesterday that there was um, an account that it may go into a supernova explosion sometime in the near future. And uh, the other interesting aspect is that the lifted leg points towards the star Sirius or Mridhagyada. So that could explain one reason why you have this very distinctive depiction of Nataraja and Ananda Tandava with the leg extended like that, which is not found anywhere in the world. And this study also um, evoked a lot of interest in me in terms of, uh, you know, choreography. And, you know, as you and I are speaking here, Pratiti, using Zoom and so on, can you think about it? This was an experiment that we did 10 years ago, whereby I was dancing in uh, Bangalore and there was a dancer in Toulouse with Kedons, Anusha Emrit, and my collaborators, uh, Jean-Marc and Anne Matos. And we were dancing to each other's virtual images to convey some of these ideas, you know, of the interplay between form and formlessness and the superposition of the stars and, you know, connection with the inner self and the outer self, the anthropomorphic body and the cosmic self. And, you know, uh, the balance between creation and destruction and one emerging out of other and so on. Um, well, it's wonderful to uh, see your dance and archaeology converge. Um, but you really started out as an engineering student. Uh, we first met at IIT Kauai when you were doing your BTEC in engineering physics. Uh, our families had known each other well, but you had grown up in Bombay. So how did you pick engineering? Was it just a natural aptitude for maths and science? Or well, that may have been one part of it, but I guess there was a lot of influence also of my father, who my hero worshipped, and he was a well-known nuclear scientist. I, I, should, I should say your father, Dr. Elmar Srinivasan, was chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission at the time. Uh, yes. Did you see a life in the pure sciences ahead of you, like his? Well, you know, uh, he was, of course, involved with building up the nuclear power program um, uh, and was uh, involved with building and overseeing many of the nuclear power reactors, such as at Kalpakam, where we were living. Uh, 
which is incidentally, it was quite close to Mahabalipuram. So there was all this, you know, the Pallava grace, which I was taking in as a child. And he used to take us around and show us all these, you know, the functioning of the reactors and talking about the process of nuclear fission, which incidentally is also related to the uranium thorium cycle, uh, as is the lead isotope analysis. So I did come back to that in a way, I guess. But I should also say that he's also written on the need for atoms for peace and worldwide nuclear disarmament. Yes, of course. So what made you decide to do archaeology? Was there a trigger, an exhibition you went to, or um, a, a moment or incident? Well, I think for that, I have to blame uh, my mother, who is also in her own right a very remarkable uh, lady. Yes, I should say that your mother, uh, Mrs. Geeta Srinivasan, is very accomplished, was the chairperson of the World Wildlife Fund in Maharashtra and the co-founder of the Uti Literature Festival. Yes, and when I was, uh, I think, at the final stages of IIT, she said, Vadi, let's go. And she just took me off on this um, uh, trek, come pilgrimage to Amarnath, which is this ice stalactite at 14,000 feet, which is worshipped as an, an iconic form of Shiva. And along the way, you meet so many, um, of course, pilgrims, but musicians and dancers and folk performers. So that really got me interested in looking at the link between uh, you know, archaeology and anthropology and a scientific, you know, understanding applied to these. So your more recent work in material science on the legendary wood steel of India has been groundbreaking. And it really sort of harks back to that engineering background uh, quite closely. Um, you know, the, the whole story of Indian steel as an export uh, is so much part of our 20th century industrial story with uh, you know, Tata Steel being set up and so on. So it's uh, quite amazing to think that Roman accounts and Pliny the Elder in the first century CE mentioned Indian steel. Um, could you tell us about your work on Woods Steel? Yes, well, Woods was, um, it's a very remarkable story because this was um, a very high grade steel, which was the first high grade steel made anywhere in the world as pointed out by the scientist Verhoeven. And it was, um, you know, and the, the ingots of woods were being traded across antiquity and uh, it, Southern India was one of the leading producers of this wood steel. Well, so this wood steel was fabled to have been exported particularly to West Asia to make the pattern Damascus swords. And the novelty of woods was that it was what we call an ultra high carbon steel, which was really not known much in Europe. So if you look at that particular composition of woods, which had about 1.5% carbon steel, you see uh, that it consisted primarily of this matrix of perlite, which was surrounded by cementite. And in fact, there's a microstructure of a nail from Putinum that you're looking at above, which has exactly that classical composition of woods. And that is one of the early examples. And in fact, the, um, the speciality was that this ingot of woods was then forged out and you get these alternating layers of perlite and cementite, which gives this wavy pattern when it's etched, which is known as the Damascus, you know, which was uh, prized by the Arabs. And that's why it was exported as Tavernier mentioned. It was the only kind of steel which could be damasked. And so in the 17th century, it was going to Persia and so on. And Henry Yule mentions that Marco Polo in the 13th century also wrote of the repute of Ondanik, which was derived from this word Hinduvani, which is also mentioned by the Arab Idrisi in the 12th century. So there was a whole body of writing uh, and excitement as far as the steel was concerned. And one of the early, uh, uh, you know, the early sites of production are also very important here in terms of understanding the production mechanism. And basically what was being done was that a low carbon wrought iron was being carburized by placing it in crucibles along with carbon rich material. And so I was able to identify some sites, for instance, Mail Sirivalur, where if you look at that cross section of the crucible, that consists of that classic composition that I just described of the ultra high carbon steel of perlite alternating with white cementite, which was used to make these famous Damascus blades. And I also studied some crucible fragments from an iron smelting furnace from Kodumanel, which is a megalithic site in Tamil Nadu. And that also had iron rich constituents related to ferrous processing. 
Now the term woods itself may refer, may derive from the Tamil word ukku or uruku, which refers to the process of melting. And it's also interesting that Zosimus, the Greek in the fourth century, mentions that Indians fused iron in crucibles to make woods. And this term yeg is also found in Tamil Sangam texts of the third century BCE to third century uh, CE in the poems of this remarkable bardic writer, Avayar, who dedicated several poems to the chieftain Anchi. And for example, there's a very uh, beautiful verse where she sings, Anchi, man of many spears, is at, is at battle. And as he sets fire to enemy camps, black battle smoke, swirls around his young elephants like mists around mountain peaks. And that's a lovely translation by A.K. Ramanujan, of course. Uh, did you um, commission that uh, very evocative uh, portrait of Avayar uh, from Paul Fernandez? For the yes. Uh, this is an illustration in our book, India's Legendary Wood Steel, by myself and Professor Ranganathan. And uh, Paul Fernandez was known to a friend of my husband's, and he very kindly came on board. We had seen his lovely illustrations of Bangalore and, uh, you know, it's very colorful past and the bungalows and so on. So he very kindly made this. And yes, Avayar is holding this, um, of course, the Ole, the palm leaf manuscript, and she looks on intently. And you can also see the reconstruction of the woods furnace in the background. So we were very lucky to have him coming on board. Marvelous. It really kind of captures her spirit party. <laughs> Absolutely. And of course, Francis Buchanan, who traveled in the Mysore region just after the fall of Tipu Sultan in the 1800s, also describes the making of wood steel. And he's given quite graphic uh, sketches of some of the woods making furnaces. And he talks about the steel making forges, which were also used to make strings for musical instruments. And I put this slide in here also knowing of your great love of music, Pratiti. As you can see, this is a lovely painting from the Darya Daulat Bagh of Sri Rangapatna, Tipu Summer Palace. And this was also from a paper by myself and Venkatesh last year. And you can see that there's a lady holding a tanpura with the strings and next to her, the violinist. So you do see the Western influence also coming in at the time. Well, in the 1800s, Woods was no match for gunpowder. And after the failed Sepoy mutiny of 1857, scores of Indian armories were destroyed by the British. And there's another interesting aspect though to the wood story, which is that many of the ingots were taken to by the European and British scientists for study and were very intensely studied. And most remarkably by the great scientist, Michael Faraday, uh, inventor of electricity and it also led to other outcomes because of course he was trying to characterize the, the uh, features of the steel, but in the process, he also was able to invent alloy steels, which had a great bearing on the industrial revolution. So there is a sense of the transfer of technology in a way. Yeah. And of course, you know, several of the fabled swords of Tipu Sultan are also of Damascus uh, steel. And I should add as an archaeometallurgist, um, it's also a matter of satisfaction that I could play a bit of a role in the study on the Tipu era rockets, the metal case rockets, which were uncovered by the Shimoga Museum from Nagara. And then this was a paper that was published by um, Nai Shejeshwar Nayak and Olikara to which we contributed. And uh, what we were able to show is that the rockets were made of high quality mild steel and they were packed with gunpowder, you know, a mixture of charcoal and sulfur and saltpeter along with the wicks. And of course, these were unfired rockets. So this was also quite an exciting study. Yes, it's, it's quite remarkable. It's really uh, the story of human technical ingenuity. Uh, you know, these, uh, this high carbon steel that you're able to forge into a sharp edge uh, for swords and so on, and then stringed instruments and music, uh, and then Tipu's rockets, which are a precursor to the modern rocket. Uh, and then at the same time, you've brought in uh, human imagination as well with the poetry of Avayar and Andal. Um, Thank you. Yes, as you were saying, uh, you know, the metal case rockets then inspired William Congreve, 
um, who went on to study them in the Royal Arsenal, and that led to the modern rocket technology. So there were the, all these spin-offs, you know, transfers of technology and so on. Um, your, your husband, Big Vijay, is from the Nilgiris, and uh, your family had connections there, but you did more work in the Nilgiris uh, with, um, with Big Vijay and came across uh, these metalworking traditions there among the me megalithic finds. Um, so uh, blacksmithy among the Kotas and heightened bronze among the Kamalars and then the uh, metal mirrors, Aranmula metal mirrors. So tell us about some of your discoveries and these artisanal legacies, which are still uh, alive. Yes, well, the Nilgiris is actually a very fascinating, um, you know, it is actually a biodiversity hotspot and so on, but is also a very ancient cultural landscape. And there are so many of these uh, local communities with distinctive practices. So I was very grateful for an insight into that also through my husband, Big Vijay, whom, as you mentioned, is also from uh, the Nilgiris. And uh, so... To go back, uh, you know, one of the interesting studies that I had managed to make was on particular classes of alloys known as heightened bronzes, of which incidentally, there are some really very interesting and early finds from the Nilgiris. Now, as I was pointing out, the Chola bronzes were leaded bronzes. And what that means in terms of the metallic structure is that typically a cast low leaded bronze has this dendritic structure and the lead is not, uh, it's what is called immiscible, it's not soluble in the solid solution of tin and copper. So it tends to segregate along the grain boundaries. But the problem is that when you keep adding tin to bronze, it actually gets more and more brittle. And bronze as such is not very workable. But the interesting aspect is that the artisans had found out that when you take a bronze of 23% tin, and if you heat it to a very high temperature between 600 and 700 degrees, as you can see in that phase diagram, which basically indicates what happens when you keep adding tin to copper at different temperatures. So between this particular uh, temperature uh, you know, range, 600 to 700 degrees centigrade, 3% tin can actually be forged very extensively due to the presence of this metastable beta phase. And somehow these artisans had been able to uh, empirically arrive at this. And so you have these marvelous vessels such as from Iron Age, Arditchenalud, which shows you know, extreme hot forging to make this very thin rimmed vessels. And just to show you what would happen if those vessels were not quenched, because on the top you see what has happened when such a vessel has been hot forged and then quenched which means it's been very rapidly cooled in water. So you get the formation of this needle-like martensitic phase, which is really very important in terms of the ductility of the bronze. But if you hadn't quenched that bronze, then you would have had this formation of this network, this bluish white network, the alpha plus delta eutectoid, which is what embrittles the bronze. So the quenching prevents that. But there is also another story that the mirrors in Kerala, which I'm going to talk about, they actually optimize the presence of this embrittling delta phase because it actually has very good specular properties and has a very good mirror finish. And those mirrors had about 33% uh, tin content where this delta phase is optimized. So as I was mentioning, uh, sorry, this is uh, some examples of this very remarkable material, these heightened beta bronzes as we call them. And you see such vessels from the Nilgiris, and you're looking at the microstructure that I was talking about again, the needle-like beta phase and the islands of alpha plus beta phase. And again, extraordinarily thin rimmed. And I'd also analyzed a vessel from Kodumanel, which is a megalithic site, which was also a heightened binary 22% tin bronze. Well, it's also interesting that uh, vessels have been made till recently by the Kamalar or bronze smiths in Kerala and Tamil Nadu of rotten quenched heightened beta bronze, which has also been confirmed by microstructural study. And you can see on top this vessel, modern vessel, which we documented myself and Digvijay in the 90s, where you see this ingot of 15 centimeters has been extensively forged out to get these large vessels. And then it's been polished to get this very brilliant uh, finish, this golden luster, which is why these were sought after. 
And some of these examples from the Nilgiris and Adi Chanlur and so on, they go back to from about the early to late first millennium BCE. And you see the same kind of structure right into the uh, recent times, you know, which points out uh, you know, as to how it is also very useful and important to make ethno-archeological observations. So just to take you through some of the steps that I was talking about, um, you see on the corner there that this ingot of heightened bronze is being heated on this anvil, which was then in those days being worked by bag bellows by the Kamalar. And then it, there are these consecutive cycles of heating and annealing and heating, forging, annealing until this beautiful shape is obtained. And then it is very rapidly quenched in water to retain that martensitic beta phase. And so many of these vessels are just, you know, being recycled these days because although the vessels have gone a bit out of vogue, that martensitic beta property of the musicality is still, you know, much sought after. So they still make musical vessels of this material. And the other tradition that I was going to talk about was the mirror making, which, uh, um, Yeah, so yes, and I was talking about the todas, of course. Um, the, um, it's interesting that these vessels have been found in several of these cairns and such like, but even into the present day, you find that these are collected and valued because there was a long-standing tradition of using these vessels. And that's also probably why these are found in the burials. And apart from the todas, you're looking here at the slide of a uh, Kota Kokkal, or village of the, uh, the Kota community, who are very well known uh, blacksmiths. And so there were these traditions of blacksmithy, so we don't know whether they were actually able to make these vessels, but certainly they were being made in Kerala and Tamil Nadu and so on. And now I come to this other technique, which is of making metal mirrors. And you're looking there at a very beautiful reflection of the late Janardhan Achari, who was one of the senior master craftspeople. And now here what is happening is that this intermetallic compound, which is a delta phase of 32.6% tin, is actually very reflective and it's very hard. It's very silvery colored. So by optimizing it, you get a very good material for a mirror. And then that was polished a lot and then you get this beautiful mirror surface. So they had actually devised a technique of casting these blanks so as to optimize the presence of this delta phase. A very thin blank was cast by taking this uh, two disc molds and leaving a gap within it. And then there's a cup on top where the alloy is placed and the whole uh, crucible come mold as it were is sealed. And so when it is heated face down, the alloy gets heated first and then it's tipped over. So it goes in there and fills that cavity. And then you get this very thin blank, which is then mounted on you know, this wooden polishing board and then it's extensively polished and so on. And even uh, it's interesting that the wooden polishing board itself is um, something which you see these days in, you know, if you look at the sculptures such as the Hoysala sculptures at Belur, you see this Madanika who is holding a, a mirror, the Darpanika, and it almost seems as if that wooden polishing board itself had been used as a mirror. And you can see that the reflective quality is so beautiful, it's almost as good as a modern mirror which has just been made by lapping this blank uh, over and over again. And you're also seeing there the family of uh, Janardhan Achari, Sudhamal, his daughter, and uh, her sons. And interestingly, Greeks also reported a mirror from the Nilgiri Kens with 30% tin. So it may well have been a longer standing tradition. So there's a lot more there to be uncovered. So thank you. Uh, you've really taken us from pieces of uh, great refinement and high polish made for the elite uh, to ordinary and commonplace objects like mirrors and vessels for our dreaming, really. Um, many of us have old vessels that we have inherited, but we don't see it as heritage, unfortunately. Yes, um, you know, because there's been an organized tradition of actually remelting these vessels and so on. And if you ask the craftspeople, at one level, it's very expensive for them to get copper and tin and make fresh alloys these days. So the recycling of the older heightened bronze vessels seems to be the way that the craft itself survives. 
And also, of course, as far as the craftspeople are concerned, they're actually doing uh, a beneficial job because once they corrode, those vessels are of no use to anybody as they see it. And it is a sustainable practice in its own right, except that in terms of today's parameters, we are losing heritage and we are losing objects that hold a certain history of technology and so on. So there is that aspect. And one is again struck by the cultural exchange and influence here from these workshops that you showed us of these metal workers to musicians across the subcontinent and swords in diff distant lands and their work and these metals and materials that have traveled uh, so widely. Yes, in fact, there's an interesting uh, dimension to the height and bronzes, which I didn't have time to talk about here, which is that uh, you also see height and bronze vessels in the context of Southeast Asia in Thailand, datable to about fourth century BCE. But these Tamil examples seem to be slightly earlier and much more extensively hot worked. And so there has been some speculation on, you know, whether the tradition may have gone from the subcontinent and so on. So there's a lot to be studied there in terms of the archeology. span And uh, how has the COVID pandemic affected some of these craftspeople? Yes, well, that is a very uh, uh, you know, important issue because there are great challenges in terms of their access to clientele and marketing and resources and so on. And another aspect, of course, is that a lot of the crafts workshops are by the riversides because traditionally they were using alluvial clays and so on. And you know, in these days when the climate issue is such a major one as well, there's also problems in terms of, you know, flooding, which might affect their livelihoods, which we had also seen in Kerala some years ago and so on. Um, you were involved with the Digital Humpy Project an exhibition that was showcased at the National Museum in New Delhi. And so much of your work marries these advances in technology with our understanding of sites and objects. So could you tell us about some of that work? Yes, uh, well, of course, Hampi itself is such a spectacular cultural and geographical landscape. And the Digital Hampi project was a large multi-institutional collaborative project, which aimed to bring together these different aspects of, you know, um, trying to look at how different aspects of computer vision and digital representation could be used in the uh, study and documentation of this spectacular heritage of the World, Her World Heritage Site of Hampi. And for example, one of the studies that we had undertaken was on the iconic uh, Narasimha image in Hampi. And we had undertaken this technique of using laser scanning to create a point cloud, which gave us a better understanding of how this Narasimha icon was made because in fact it had a missing Lakshmi image, seated Lakshmi image of which only the hand survives. So this was a large multi-institutional project which was partly hemmed by us at NIAS, including myself and Professor Shetter and Professor Raghunathan. And another important dimension was to um, look at the iconometry and so on. And you're looking here at a very beautiful and uh, inscribed example of the portrait bronze of uh, Krishna Devaraya, the great Vijayanagara ruler. And this is from the Tirumala temple attributed to 1518, according to inscription. And we had showed that the iconometry of this image of Krishna Devaraya actually follows the Dashatala proportion, which I had mentioned before, if you remember, which is associated with the major deities like Vishnu and Rama. So that's also quite interesting because it suggests that there was a notion of divine kingship. But at the same time, it's interesting that the crown of Krishna Devaraya does not follow what you see in the crowns of the deities and so on, whether it's at Lepakshi or the bronzes. Rather, it follows uh, you know, the fashion that is found, for example, at Lepakshi and is also associated with the Deccan Sultanate, the Kulai, the cap, which is uh, worn in the Deccan Sultanate regions. The, um, uh, of course, the uh, Lepakshi had been a province of the Vijayanagara Empire, so uh, these go provincial governors also were wearing these uh, caps. And caps are, uh, uh, well, headgear in general is a badge of rank, isn't it? Um, and I mean, this particular mural at Lepakshi, it always reminds me of a, of a kind of Ottoman velvet and, uh, you know, with work on it. 
Um, and um, of course, there were traders, there was so much trade at the time with the Vijayanagar Empire. But um, it's also interesting that this kind of a hat is related to the bishop's mitre that, we, that bishops wear today, uh, because it came from the Phrygian cap in, uh, uh, well, Fr Phrygium at the time, which is today Anatolia in modern day Turkey. Um, oh, thank you. That's a very interesting, uh, you know. And, and also I... the French Revolution liberty was also uh, derived, had the same derivation. Oh, amazing. Well, you're right, because now that you mention it, I'm also reminded of the Sufi Davishes who wore a similar cap. And I don't know whether there is some association there in this depiction of Krishna Devaraya with that particular cap, along with his uh, two wives. So yes, a very fascinating. Uh, it's a very beautiful image from Tirupati. Yes, absolutely. Well, um, so the main aim of this uh, digital humpy exercise was also to have a way of documenting all of these wonderful icons. And for example, the fascinating chariot shrine to Garuda, according to 19th century photographs, it actually had a superstructure, brick superstructure, which is now collapsed. So we were attempting to use these techniques, AutoCAD and so on, to actually digitally reconstruct the super, superstructure. But then also you find that this exhibition, which was held in the National Museum, what it had attempted to do was to actually get the digital printouts of these monuments, the 3D printouts of the monuments. So that's what you're seeing here, some of the 3D printouts of the Vitala Temple and the Chariot Shrine, and with the digitally reconstructed superstructure in terms of the Vitala Temple complex. Example. So uh, tell me, is this made of paper? How, how does the model come out? Is it all one piece already, or does it have to be assembled? Yes, so this process of uh, uh, making a 3D digital print actually comprises of the following steps. First, you undertake laser scanning of the entire monument, and then you generate this 3D point cloud. And then you undertake this 3D printing from that point cloud of each monument. And that is usually done in some material which can you know, easily take all those very intricate designs and contours and so on. For instance, it could be a polymer or a polylactose and so on. So yes, it's very amazing what can be achieved with technology. And also you're looking here at the Vitala temple complex with those set of colonnades, which have quite often been described as musical pillars because they have this property of resonance. And for instance, there are some colonnades which have sculptures of a drummer and they give off a deeper sound, uh, you know, as associated with a drum. And there are some of the colonnades which have a higher pitch sound, which is associated with the cymbal and so on. So I also got interested in trying to understand the properties of the rock and how the porphyritic granite in this case, and whether that plays a role in terms of the tonalities. And indeed, uh, the thin section analysis showed that it consists quite a lot of a mineral called orthoclase, which has a monoclinic structure, which could contribute to that tonality in the way that the martensite also contributed to the tonality. And there was also a digital display of the pillars at that exhibition. And I should also say that I also got interested in the aspect of the musical pillars as a Bharatanatyam dancer. I had done a choreography on the Saptaswara pillars but another little um, adventure, so to speak, in archaeology was that uh, we had done this exploration of this megalithic site of Hirebenkal, which is only about 35 kilometers from Hampi. And it is also made of these resonant uh, porphyritic granites, because that is a natural property of the rock, as I was saying. And, you know, you have to believe that when they were quarrying this rock to make these wonderful dolmens with the potholes and all that, which are resonant, they would have probably encountered this property of tonality. And incidentally, the way they could have quarried this rock is because they, here you find there are thin layers of granite and there are you know, lines of cleavage due to the spalling of granite. So it would have been quite easy for them to cut it. It's just in those two dimensions that they have to cut it. And then uh, you get these thin slabs to make these um, capstones and all the rest of it. And there was this particular spot that I had gone to with this uh, French musician and lithophonist. And we just found that that was such a perfect performance space because he was able to uh, you know, 
play the resonant rocks. And when I was dancing on it as well, the rocks were resonant. So yes, that was one of the more magical experiences, I would say. Well, you've been such an intrepid traveler and the work of the archeologists often entails difficult journeys. I mean, here you are finding musical granite and uh, you know, going to remote parts of the country to megalithic sites, which can be lonely and even dangerous. Um, so could you tell us about maybe uh, serendipitous discoveries or a trip that really stands out, a, a wild moment? Yes, well, um, I would say that, uh, you know, this was actually in 1990. And so I was visiting some of the copper mines in the region of Agni Gundala in Andhra Pradesh. And you're seeing one of the few photographs from that early period in 1991. And there is a lot of this, uh, you know, the, the malachite ore that you see there. And not long after I was at this spot, when we were kind of trying to follow the load in going into the rock, and then we came across, uh, you know, this rustling sound. So I turned to see, you know, what is that? And believe you me, Pratiti, it was a big cat. And yes, it was a cheetah. It was not a leopard because it had these spots, distinctive spots. And I turned to the person from Hindustan Zinc who was with me and I said, no, that wasn't a cheetah, was it? Because also it moved so quickly, it was often a flash. And he said, yes, ma'am, you're right. It is a cheetah and it has been spotted here because you know this was the original habitat, the Guntur district. And although the cheetah has been known to be extinct for a while, this may be just have been one of those you know, stray cubs which was still alive. And it had been spotted as well by people in the Hindustan Zinc. But unfortunately, I have to say, I was not, um, you know, I didn't have the luck that Amma has had where she has managed to um, photograph, uh, take very beautiful photographs of tigers in the wild and so on. And I come to this slide because, you know, since you were mentioning it, this is also probably one of my very early articles which I wrote for Frontline so many years ago on this pilgrimage or trek to Kashmir, you know, going through the spectacular Kashmir Himalayas. And, uh, you know, Appa also in his own way has been quite an intrepid uh, traveler. And uh, so we're there with the Kurunjis. And uh, as I'd mentioned earlier, Digvijay and Lassia have also accompanied me to the mirror making workshops. And uh, speaking of the UT Lit Fest, Amma had also managed to restore the Nilgiri Library. So I guess they all, they've also been part of this very uh, eventful and idiosyncratic journey, so to speak. Um, with all of this interdisciplinary work and these connections you're making, uh, it's all fine to talk about it, but uh, there are very real difficulties, aren't there? Um, one of the challenges is to find someone who is equally trained in two or more disciplines. Uh, one is generally trained better in one than in the other. So there's a bias in one direction. Um, and at the end of the day, you have to belong to a department and uh, institutionally speaking, you know. So what are some of the challenges you've encountered? Yes, well, I should say that, um, you know, the, the major, um, it, it is very difficult because at one level you have to be, um, uh, you know, you have to work twice as hard because you have to be- I, I had a friend who said she felt she had done two PhDs at the end of an interdisciplinary project. Yes, absolutely. You have to devote yourself wholly to both these disciplines, you know, in this case, maybe the scientific aspect and the art history. And you have to really, you know, you, you and it's, of course, a lot of us do these, various different activities and we can be, you know, jacks of, jack of all trades, but then you have to also master them enough to be able to make some meaningful, you know, interventions and such like. But I think there is a need for people who really try to do that because otherwise we would be working in silos. And there are other challenges, for example, maybe I've encountered, you know, art historical journals who may say that, you know, we can't possibly publish results which are found from technical analysis or, you know, it needs to have been found through inscriptional or historical study. And on the other hand, you might have the technical journals who would say, you know, there's too much of the art historical content coming in. Because in a way, you have to ratify the two. It's not enough if the scientific study is pointing to something which may or may not actually make sense when you put it against the art history. For example, 
you know, you can, you know, you could have, uh, you know, at some point the recycling of some metal. So there could be some image which is a complete outlier stylistically and it's falling into a certain period. And you can't automatically conclude that that was actually an earlier period, uh, you know, image. You have to also take into account the stylistic aspect. It's possible that it was just an earlier image which was completely recycled. So you have to understand these nuances, um, you know, in their totality. So that does make it very challenging. And also there are challenges in terms of, you know, the funding sources and things like that, because often, you know, all of these operate within very distinct parameters. You have science, you know, funding sources for scientific work or maybe separately for humanities or social sciences, but the in between of the grayer areas, it is a bit of a challenge, I guess, to, you know, forge ahead in those. Um, our, our monuments and our materials heritage even the living legacies among artisans seem under so much threat. And uh, to a young person wanting to become an archaeologist, what would you say? Does your, does your daughter Lassia have an interest? Um, <laughs> does Lassia have an interest? I think, you know, she's at that stage where she wants her own identity. And, you know, so, um, uh, you know, so she would not want to be seen as following in mama's footsteps or whatever but i think it has maybe had an influence in subtle ways and sometimes you know she she used to do these school projects or college projects where you could see some of these influences coming in for example she had made a triptych you know like a code that you see for example in the da vinci code she made something like that um, you know related to the bidri process of you know bidri casting and so on where they make this very fine uh, you know decorative metal where which is based of a high zinc alloy, so to speak, with the silver uh, inlay and so on. So she, you know, gone to thought about it and come out with something different in that. So there are the ways in which these influences go in. And what I would say to the younger generation, you know, of course, so I took the, let's say I took the uh, road less traveled and so on. And, you know, for me, there was a lot of personal fulfillment and professional fulfillment as well in doing that. I think, uh, you know, it's, it is good to box and it can, you know, lead to very interesting outcomes. And to that extent, I should also perhaps be a champion for my field and say that archaeology in a way is a very uh, interesting subject. It's not just, you know, about an arcane past as it were, but you see, for instance, it gives you an insight into history of technology. There are so many fields. And also you understand the cognitive processes by which, you know, certain materials and so on came into, uh, you know, came into usage and so on, which also has a lot of relevance in terms of the way we look at, uh, you know, the future and technology for the future and so on. And also I'm reminded of another seminal influence, I suppose, on my work, who, which came from my late uncle, C.D. Seshadri, uh, who was, of course, working a lot for technology for rural development and uh, appropriate technology. And he was also one of the people who, impressed on me the need for documenting the artisanal legacies, for example. And he used to keep saying that, you know, in science and technology, it is always said that you should not reinvent the wheel, which means that, you know, if a discovery or invention has already been made, you know, you move on from there. But he used to say that, yes, you should try reinventing the wheel because then you understand the steps that have gone into it. And then that'll lead to something else of relevance. And of course, that was in the context of the appropriate technology that, you know, we need to take the Western innovations which work for their particular circumstances and re-examine how they work for us within our uh, particular set of parameters, you know, within non-Western situations and so on. But also that I think also works for archaeology because in a way, you know, when you undertake experimental archaeology and you try and understand how these objects were made, whether it is from the microstructures or from the experimental simulations, then you, uh, you know, understand a lot about metals and materials and so on, which could have significance for, you know, for the developments and the progress of the technology itself, but also to be able to integrate the artisans into the pedagogy of academic practice and so on, as they are left out of it quite a bit, which could also provide some value addition for these artisans and for their very rich traditions and so on. So. Thank you. Um, we have time for a few questions from our audience. Um, please type your questions in the Q&A box. Um, so to begin with, um, Nina Baker asks, 
You have mentioned the lead content of the bronzes and the mercury used in the gilding process. Is anything known of the health effects on the craft workers? Yes, well, of course, um, you know, the mercury is a toxic material. And uh, so, but I think there haven't been any um, particular studies because to some extent, this mercury gilding has died out of most of the Indian subcontinent at any rate. It, it's still practiced in Nepal and so on. Um, and uh, so you see, for, for, for that, we need to actually, we don't really find that much of evidence in the archeological context of furnaces and foundries or you know, skeletons of artisans and you know, things of that nature, which would help us to piece together all of uh, these kinds of effects. But you know, there were, uh, there were the side effects, for instance, quite often the arsenic poisoning used to result in you know, lameness and things like that, which was observed quite a bit with, um, in, in the West, for instance. So I think that's a whole area in terms of you know, the, the effects, which it is rather more difficult to study it in terms of you know, the, what has happened in the past. It may have had some effect, but uh, you know, it's still practiced in Nepal, and I, I don't think the artisans uh, have uh, stopped doing it because of that. So you know, we need to look at how much it has actually affected them or not, we can't say. Yeah. Nirupama Kaushik asks, is it typical for the eyes to be closed or half open in all these sculptures? Yeah, well, um, I guess, you know, it's an interesting uh, aspect because of course some of them, you know, the Nepalese images and so on, they also have the eyes inlaid, you know, uh, so that they're clearly open and they have, um, you know, you can see that the white part of it as well and the, you know, the, the central portion. So the, those are, uh, some of them do have this uh, open kind of quality, but yes, you do get that sensation of the, the half closed eyes, which, uh, you know, it's a sort of meditative, you know, this quality of transcendence or something, which, which the images do convey. And I think the eyes do form a very important part of it and so on, yeah. And um, Janavi Ananta Kumar asks, which god is worshipped in the Adi Turei temple? Yes, so Adi Turei is actually a temple built by Sembian Mahadevi in the 10th century. And that image that I showed you um, is one of the early images of uh, Nataraja, which you see in sculpture, in stone, uh, because it's really in um, the time of Sembian Mahadevi that you see those very prominent uh, rounded sculptures of Nataraja in stone. So this was a Shaivite temple, of course, because you know the early Cholas and all were very, um, you know, prominently Shaivite worshippers. And of course, the interesting aspect is also that uh, you know, uh, when we talk about Sembian Mahadevi, she was very remarkable also because she really had a sense of history, and she had some of the earlier inscriptions also recopied in stone, the Pallava inscriptions and uh, you know such like, which is also what sets her apart. You know? That's remarkable. Bhanumati yes. um, VV asks, could you elucidate more on the lead isotopic analysis and why is there a difference in the ratio in the different periods? Yes, so, um, you know, when we talk about um, the bronzes, um, well, I know a lot of times people talk about these bronzes as being panchaloha, which is, you know, five metal. But in actual practice, you know, you don't get, uh, you know, five metals in very large constituents. These are mainly leaded bron bronzes or leaded brasses. And that's also because, you know, when you look at the phase diagram, it's not really very feasible to make, uh, you know, alloying constituents with so many metals and so on. So these are leaded bronzes or leaded brasses. So there was some lead which was intentionally alloyed to make the bronze a bit more castable, yeah? So that's why many of these are high lead bronzes. And now what happens is that when we alloy um, elements to copper in this case, uh, to some extent, the alloying, is, when it's intentional, it, it is random. You can't really predict, you know, whether it is uh, associated with the ore source or not, because this is intentionally added, right? But when you look at the trace element constituents, then there can be some clustering, which is based on the intrinsic uh, properties of the ore, because 
some ores are more ch chalcophilic than others, and so they would have some constituents of typical elements such as nickel, cobalt, arsenic, antimony, and bismuth, and so on, which would tend to you know, enrich in, in the copper and which would relate to the ore source. But the problem when you use elements alone is that the elements also undergo some changes you know, during the smelting process and so on. But the isotopic ratios have this property that you know, the isotopic ratio is unchanged you know, despite the pyrotechnological process and despite the smelting process from the ore to the finished object. And lead in this case is one of the few elements which has measurably distinct isotopic ratios um, you know, in different ore deposits. And that relates back to the geochemistry of uranium, thorium, that cycle and so on. So that's why, you know, ore sources tend to have discrete lead isotope ratios. And so that can be used in the sense that when you're seeing that kind of clustering, what it probably indicates that in the Chola period, they were using copper from a particular source along with lead from a particular source, which was giving that distinctive uh, fingerprint, which was different from what was used in the Vijayanagara period. Now, it need not always be like that because sometimes if they were using lead from different sources, then you can get a very mixed profile. And that happens quite a lot with coinage. You just get a huge scatter, even if you take, I think there's a lot of work been done on Mediterranean coinage and it just scatters a lot. But here, I think perhaps also because these were images, that perhaps they were made from primary freshly smelted metal. So you are seeing these distinct, distinct you know, uh, clusters which relate to the ore source. Of course, another dimension is that we actually need to do much more work on actually identifying those ore sources because we don't have exhaustive lead isotope ratios for all the ore sources in the world. We do have them for some parts of the world, such as the Mediterranean, maybe some for China and so on. So we really need to actually uh, build up this data bank of lead isotope ratios, and then we can much more uh, closely actually attribute particular ore sources to certain artifacts. And I didn't really have time to show that much, but a few artifacts could be, few bronzes could be identified to some ore sources and so on. But I think it becomes a very vast topic if I go into all of that. And I do have to say something for further lectures and such like. <laughs> um. N. Shashidara asks, it is believed that Boots steel swords were made by Kempe Gauda in Magadi region. The soil around Magadi area contains ferrous content. Do you, could you speak to that? Um, is that a, um, so what is the question then? Um, I guess uh, if you wanted to elaborate more on that, on uh, Kempe Gauda. Yeah. Well, Magadi I think region. that, um, you know, there yeah, needs sorry. to be a lot more work also done in terms of documenting the swords and armories. So I think before we actually study the swords, we cannot assume, uh, you know, what was being done, whether A, it was woods. Because also it's interesting that that pattern that you saw, the alternating light and dark, um, although you can get that by t starting out with the ingot of woods and then hammering it, you can also actually get it by... Uh, Sorry? Okay, you're back. Oh, we lost you for a bit. Go ahead. There's another you, method you which is... Get it. Are you losing me again? No, we've got you. Yeah. you. You were saying you can also get it by another method. Yeah, but you don't get quite that uh, sophisticated pattern, but you can get... Um, what you can do is you can take low carbons, iron, and high carbon, uh, uh, you know, iron, and hammer them together, you know, in alternating, um, uh, sort of um, alternating them, and you do get a pattern. And that is what is called pattern welded swords. So you can't necessarily say whether those were pattern welded or whatever. So you have to actually look, go back and look at which swords you are talking about and so on. And I think also, of course, you know, in, in, if you look at historical information, there is a lot of sources and writing, but ultimately we have to make the correlation, we have to actually find the artifacts and then study it within that context to make the, uh, you know, connections. Um. Um, v. Shivashankara Shastri asks, which is the largest metal sculpture found in India? Yeah, well, that's why I put in the slide of the Sultan Ganj Buddha, which is the largest, uh, at least extant one, largest metal sculpture, and it, it's really life-size. It's, you know, over... Uh, six feet or so, and uh, it's in the Birmingham Museum. So that is of the late Gupta period. 
Um, and that was, as I mentioned, made from the hollow lost wax casting process. Um, Sachdev Ramakrishna asks, were these bronzes largely commissioned for use at temples, although for professional, uh, processional use? Or did they find patronage also from wealthy families who wanted to have a family deity statue at home for worship? Yeah. Well, um, at least as far as the early inscriptions, the Chola inscriptions and all that are concerned, um, you know, there is, of course, a lot of it is royal patronage. For instance, you have inscriptions, you know, mentioning Sembian Mahadevi's dedications and so on. So a lot of it were, were um, you know, but you also have a lot of uh, inscriptions which, for instance, um, you know, the, the Chola queens were actually very active patrons. Uh, you know, and apart from Sendin Mahadevi, Loka Mahadevi, and also you find that the dancing uh, the, the ladies, the, the, you know, the Devadasi community, they're also mentioned as, uh, you know, patrons and so on, um, you know, the Nachayar and so on. So that they were also one of the large um, communities that patronized the bronzes, the, the, the Devadasis and so on. And, uh, you know, there, there are some of them do have donor inscriptions, for instance, the very famous uh, uh, Bhikshatanar, which you see in the Tanjavur Art Gallery. So that was uh, said to have been donated by uh, Amalan Sevayar, who's, you know, an, or maybe a wealthy, wealthy patron and so on. So, um, but as to the evidence for the family date, I mean, you were saying the date is being kept at home. Well, that I'm not sure how old that practice is, though I suppose that also needs, you know, much more of, uh, you know, study and investigation to know, to look into that, yeah. Because, of course, what, what the uh, Sapathis and all talk about, of course, in the past was more the dedication to the temples and so on. In, in general, most of these inscriptions, uh, which help us to date things, are, uh, come from gifts, don't they? Yes. yes. Uh, to temples in general, or yes, yes, donations as they call it, and uh, the the Buddhist and uh, Jain images also quite often have these donor inscriptions. But those were in 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 the case of those, you can say that those were also votive images which were actually taken around. Uh, you know, uh, there is that aspect of the votive images, but um, you know, this, so it needs a lot more of this kind of integrated study to piece all of this together. And it's also interesting that you mentioned that so many of these women of that time seem to have had uh, an, an understanding of the beauty of these images and wanted to commission them and uh, donate them as gifts to the temple. Yes, because I mean, um, clearly, for instance, Sembian Mahadevi, there is the temple at Koneri Rajapuram where she has also put in a little plaque, which is dedicated to her late husband, Gandharaditya Chola, who was in fact a, um, a great devotee of Shiva, and he was also a poet, and he fasted unto death. And, uh, you know, so this, uh, it, it was a way of memorialization that she set up this plaque and this temple, which also has a very beautiful Nataraja. And that also, in a way, um, I think inspired me as a dancer because I also did this little, um, you know, Bhatanachim piece where, uh, uh, you know, there's almost something Jungian here where we talk about creation emerging out of destruction, you know, in, in the terms of the physical uh, process, but there's also, you know, the uh, one's own creativity emerging out of, you know, loss and destruction, which perhaps, you know, at least as a dancer, I saw in the acts of patronage of Sembian Mahadevi, also of the Nataraja bronze. And so there was this little piece which uh, I had done, uh, you know, Petra Tai Tane Magam Marandal, which is beautifully sung by Subalakshmi, actually. And so in that, I had tried to show a little bit of this, the bronze casting and, you know, uh, the personality of Sembian Mahadevi and so on. So Do we know uh, why? She impressed me a lot, yes. She okay. does inspire me. Do we know why her husband fasted unto the death? Was there a, a reason or was it just devotion in general? Is it mentioned? Well, it's an interesting um, example because a lot of, uh, you know, don't forget that uh, there was a legacy also from Jainism of asceticism and, uh, you know, relinquishing, uh, you know, the, the throne and becoming an ascetic. Uh, 
And in, in his like case, him. that is also the, the route that he seems to have taken. And he also wrote the Tiruva Saipa and then he passed unto death. So there were these traditions of asceticism, which were still valued, you know, going back to maybe uh, when Chandragupta Maurya went off to Shavana Belagola or Ashoka renounces and becomes a Buddhist and so on. So, you know, but in this case, of course, it was renouncing and fasting as, as a devotee of Shiva, which may have also been, uh, you know, interlinked to Shaiva Siddhantic practices and influence, which were there in that region, in the Pallava and Chola period and so on. Alok Srivatsava asks, in the light of the historic Black Lives Matter movement, uh, moment and a renewed interest in social justice, could you speak a bit about the representation of the lower castes or other historically marginalized groups in India in the space of archaeology and art appreciation, especially in terms of access to temples and deities? Yes, Were the makers course. from lower castes? Sorry? Were the makers of images from lower castes? Yes, of course, that's a very important okay. dimension and, uh, you know, the social history, it's, it's a whole vast topic in its own right. Um, of course, the uh, artisanal community were, uh, you know, they were formed part of what was called the Vishwakarma, who were, uh, you know, in the sense that they were at one level, they were considered a lower caste community. Um, although they, uh, you know, they took on the um, uh, you know, they considered themselves actually as superior in a way, even to, you know, they call themselves Vishwa Brahmin, which is superior to the Brahmins in a way, uh, you know, as creative people. So it's, it's interesting that they, um, in their own mythology and so on, they saw themselves, you know, as being, um, you know, uh, as being, uh, in fact, superior in a way because of this creative process. But there were all these dimensions, of course. Um, of course, with the sculptors and sapatis, uh, you know, it, it's maybe a slightly different story, but uh, although you see in the earlier writings, you know, the blacksmiths and so on had a very high position, but eventually, you know, the social status and so on, uh, you know, did fall also with the economic uh, prospects declining and all that sort of thing. But, you know, what I really find also very fascinating about the Chola image is that it's not only the story of the deities and so on, but there is also, you know, a lot of the portrayals of you know, a more ordinary kind of nuance coming in from the way they portray the, the poet saints. You know, you have Manika Vachikar uh, there, and then you have Karaika Lamayar, who looks like a hag. You know, she's a, a devotee who turned herself into a hag to worship Shiva and so on. And, um, you know, and even when you read the poetic, uh, you know, the, the poetry of the, let's say, the Nayanmar and so on. So there is this identification also with Shiva as, you know, there, there was, this was a bhakti movement at that time, which was in a way a subversion of the, you know, the organized Brahminical religion or whatever, even if it didn't totally, uh, you know, set that aside. But, you know, for instance, evoking Shiva as, you know, a wandering uh, mendicant or even a madman who's dancing around creation grounds and so on. And the Shaiva Siddhantik themselves were also I think they were also dancers in their own right, but they also actually, um, you know, there is this, uh, as you say, this breakdown of the caste hierarchies and so on, and the way they approached, uh, you know, the, this whole, the bhakti movement and so on. And also the bhakti pantheon also represents so many women, you know, there's Andal, who's also herself deified, and, uh, you know, um, and there's, there's some of them, and there's Nachayar also, who's the wife of Sundarar, who's a dancer, again, she's not from, let's say one of the, the higher class and so on. So there is this um, attempt to uh, have a more inclusive pantheon and so on, which makes it all very much more interesting. And even the portrayals are, you know, very interesting because you suddenly see, you know, um, you know, for instance, there is um, the, the set of bronzes of Rishabhavahana Deva in the Tanjavur art gallery where Shiva is depicted as a, a cow herd, you know, and you see that typical, uh, you know, headgear, this mm -hmm. pastoral form with a bull. So there is coming in of a lot of, Nuances Again, of the ordinary head, folk as well. Headgear uh, indicating the, uh, headgear is a badge of rank. Yes, yes, yeah. that too. Yes. Um, so all of those kinds of dimensions, I suppose. Yes. But of course, it's an area that needs uh, more study and more, uh, you know, um, critical writing and all those. And and this, these bhakti movements actually, which uh, migrated north, north from the south, isn't it? Yes. And also there is, uh, you know, the, the poetry of Nandanar who asks, you know, he's an untouchable, but he would, 
you know, he wants to get a glimpse of the darshan of Shiva and asks Nandi to move aside, which apparently he does and so on. So there is a lot of this kind of poetry where it takes cognizance of some of these, um, uh, you know, hierarchies and in their own way try to subvert it. We don't know how successfully or not, but anyway, that's another story, I suppose. Yeah. Um, Uday Kumar PL asks, there must have been schools of sculpture or sculptor unique styles. Uh, is it correct to call them Chola, Pandya, etc., instead of the sculptor's or school's name? Uh, uh, is, it, is it possible to identify masters from a certain period this early? Well, unfortunately, there are not too many names of uh, sculptors and things like that in inscriptions. There are a few, like, you know, the Chola temple. Uh, there is a mention of Perin Tachan or, you know, the builder of one of the walls of the temples and so on. But you don't actually find very easily inscriptions that relate to the sculptors. Of course, you do in, in the case of the Hoysalas, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, uh, inscriptions of sculptors and so on. But uh, that's around 12th century. But in the Chola period and so on, it's, um, you know, not that easy. But I suppose, you know, there needs to be more work done on the inscriptions and uh, things like that. But I still feel that, you see, because the royal uh, patronage was very important. And the other point is that to a large extent, this identification of styles and schools has also depended on the sculptures in, in the temples, which are associated with certain patrons. And that is certainly a useful way of approaching it because, uh, you know, even in my study of bronzes, I did feel that there is, uh, you know, one could maybe correlate um, the, the sculptural style associated in the temples with a certain patron, you know, whether it's Rajaraja or Rajendra, with, um, you know, there's a certain type of sculpture that you see. And then you can ident you know, also kind of correlate that a bit to the bronzes, which are attributed to that kind of period, in, in the case of some of them, though I'm still publishing this work. So it's not totally uh, without um, relevance in that sense. And even the Pallava, for instance, I showed you that Pallava Nataraja, as it were, and uh, I didn't have time to dwell on that. But for instance, it had these very distinct, the looped sashes, the Kati Sutra. And you do find that very clearly in other Pallava, um, you know, the, 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 for instance, in Mahabalipuram and so on, the, those looped sashes. So that is something which you do find in that particular kind of um, Pallava sculptural or bronze depiction. So it, it's not without its relevance. Though, of course, these clarifications as that's the whole point of, you know, undertaking more research in art history or inscriptions or a historical study, that the more you study, the more material you have with which to finesse all of these. And the technical study is contributing in its own way. And that's an interesting dimension to it. Though, of course, it can't you know, tell the whole story as well. So, Dr. Prabhakar Sangumat says, uh, these archaeological sites like Nilgiris should be made geotourism sites. Do you, would you like to comment? Um, so the archaeological sites should be made geotourism. Well, I think there like is Neil Gries. Neil Gries. Well, at one level, there is definitely scope for geotourism as far as the, in, the old workings or the old mining sites are concerned, you know, and we need to also preserve the slag heaps, which, uh, you know, preserve all this technology of mining and metallurgy. I didn't put in too much of all that here, but... Uh, you know, the old workings themselves. And coming to the Nilgiris, they actually didn't show it here, but they do have some interesting old gold workings and so on, which have, of course, been mined out, but those are quite interesting. Um, well, when you talk about geotourism, you know, I think it's, as far as the communities themselves are concerned, I, I don't think, you know, I think the Todas are quite happy with not having hordes of tourists coming and, you know, um, they, they have certain self-respect and sense of who they are and, you know, especially the indigenous culture. So we, we must respect that, but maybe have a way of, uh, you know, approaching and learning and so on, which can be, uh, you know, which, which can be a kind of more progressive way of approaching tourism and so on. Yes, that could certainly be, you know, um, a direction. And there are, of course, very spectacular spots in the New uh, you know. We, and for instance, the Todas, uh, th th there, are, there is a great sense of the sacred landscapes and, you know, there are certain lakes which they hold sacred and so on. But, you know, their, their language, not many people speak them and so on. So there are very few people who can actually, I mean, Tarun has managed to go and document some of it. 
So I think we need to approach it with, yes, it, it needs to be in a more enlightened way. I don't think it should become like a mass tourism kind of thing, but certainly it's an enlightened way, yes. Well, um, Sharda, thank you for this window into your remarkable journey and life work, bringing together the fields of art history and art metallurgy. Uh, they were big words to us, but you've given us an insight into these fields and uh, the unusual life path that you have charted for yourself. <clears throat> Hopefully it will inspire more young people to do this kind of important work, uh, which is at the confluence of art and science. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pratiti. And again, let me say that it's a wonderful opportunity and uh... Um, you know, and I think that this is, it's great to have this conversation going on uh, all of these important aspects and also interdisciplinarity and uh, such like. So we hope that there's, um, you know, aspects of interest for people to take away. And uh, thank you all for your time. And again, thank you to BIC for this very patient listening and opportunity and so on. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, and thanks to our audiences for watching. Please join us for our next program. And thank you also for the very interesting questions, and I think that was you know, an interesting discussion as well, because, um, you know, and, I, and it's, it's great that this format, in a way, of webinars has enabled us to reach out to, you know, a larger audience and engage in these ways, and, you know, do take the time and trouble to document and preserve, you know, your old parties <laughs> or grandmother's plates and so on, because all of this tell a story of both technology and uh, human endeavor and so on. And all the best to all of you and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.